All right, we're, uh, we're still studying searching for Jesus, and last week we started to look at the tabernacle as the body of Jesus in the Old Testament. And I know that's a bit odd sounding, but what we're really talking about, of course, is the church. Because in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, uh, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that God gave Jesus to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, if you're in here and you don't have a copy of the class notes, they're over there, they're right there on that box, right straight back behind, from me, and you're welcome to have them there. That's what they're there for. So, we, we're, we begin looking at Hebrews chapter 9, which clearly is, is running a, an interesting uh, relationship imagery uh, that we need to look at. <clears throat> so we'll start again at the beginning, just read these verses and pick up where we left off. Uh, then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherub, cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. Now what we're really seeing here is that the tabernacle was, was laid out uh, according to, uh, we, we might say it, was the, it became the blueprint of the church and heaven. So the holy place, which is the first room that you go into in the tabernacle, where the priest served on a daily basis, that first room is the church. The second room, which is called the Holy of Holies, or in this case, I believe they translated it, holiest of all, uh, that place is representative of heaven. And so we looked last week at some of the uh, various articles uh, uh, that were in uh, the holy place, and we noted what those things would be in the church. Then, as we closed out, we noted that there was the second veil. That's The first veil is the one they went through to get, in. it's the door, we might say, into the tabernacle. The second veil is the veil that stands between the holy place and the most holy place. And that veil was the one that was torn into top to bottom uh, when Jesus died. And, and thereby, the way into the mercy seat was opened up. And now, we're really not interested today. Don't misunderstand me. We need to know about it. But as far as uh, our relationship to things that are going on, we're not concerned about the mercy seat in the tabernacle. First of all, the tabernacle doesn't exist anymore. But we're concerned about what the mercy seat stood for. So if you go back and you trace through uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy particularly, you will notice that the Shekinah, or the glory of God, came down when he was going to be with his people, and it rested on the mercy seat. That then is representative of the throne of God. 
So the way to the very throne of God was opened up when Jesus died. And that's really true, isn't it? Because in his death, he shed his blood. And we're going to talk more about that blood as we go on through this chapter. But that blood played a critical, critical role uh, in, in the things that we uh, wish to know about. So verses 9 and 10, it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerning, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Okay, now, reformation. Uh, interesting word. Uh, usually we think Reformation, we're thinking about uh, about 1350, you know, somewhere along in there. That's not what he's talking about here at all. Instead, this word translated Reformation uh, describes the repairing of something that's broken. Okay, God's relationship with man was broken. It was broken because of man's sin. And the problem was that the law of Moses had no means of getting rid of sin. If you can't get rid of sin, then you cannot, be, cannot have a good relationship with God. Thus, when Jesus came, he came to repair that broken relationship between God and man. Now, he talks about some things that are there, and I give you a pretty good list uh, in your notes uh, of each of these things, I'm not going to go into all of them. These are things that were done in the tabernacle by the priests. But the most important thing to notice is that the sacrifices that were offered there, offered both for the sins of the people and for the sins of the high priest, that those sacrifices could not work. There's no way they could work. And the reason I say that is because of what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 10, verse 4, when he says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So they didn't have a, way, a means of getting rid of their sin under the law of Moses. So let's go on. Hebrews 9, we'll pick up at verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? All right. Now, in, the more I've studied this, the, there are words that jump out at me, as, as often happens when you're reading biblical text. And the word that really stands out in this chapter, starting really with verse 12, is blood. So watch this. You've got not with the blood of goats and calves. And then he says, but with his own blood. So that's twice there in one verse. He talks about blood. We've got the blood that was offered under the, under the law of Moses in the tabernacle. Why is that not going to do the job? Because it can't take away sin. We've already seen that. Chapter 10. But instead, he offered his own blood. Why was that important? Because he was a man. Who violated the law? Did bulls and goats violate the law? That's pretty easy, right? No, they, they didn't violate the law. Who violated the law? Man did. So uh, who's going to have to suffer for that? You see, a man's got to die for it. But it can't be just any man. It's got to be a perfect man. Now, there's a problem with that. 
Because for all of us, we've got to say, well, we all sin and come short of the glory of God. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. There's none righteous, no, not one. That's Romans chapter 3, verse 10. So uh, who's going to die for us? It's got to be somebody perfect. We'll turn over to the book of 1 Peter briefly. The Apostle Peter talks about these matters in uh, chapter 2. <clears throat> As he talks about it, he makes it very, very clear uh, what we're, we're talking about. Pick up verse 21. Uh, for to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. It's pretty powerful when you think about it, uh, because Jesus was the only perfect man, and a man had to die. Somebody had to die for my sins. Somebody had to die for your sins. But I want to go a step further. We're going to see more about that as we make our way along here. Jesus really had to die for the sins of every man that lived since Adam. Adam could not go to heaven without Jesus Christ. Abel, as good as he was, could not go to heaven without Jesus Christ. Noah could, go, could not go to heaven without Jesus Christ. Abraham could not go to heaven without Jesus Christ. I keep going. How many people you want to name here out of the Bible? Because the truth is, nobody can enter heaven without the blood of Jesus. And he's going to talk about that more later in this chapter. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture that he has here. The church and heaven are the more perfect tabernacle. Now notice, not made with hands. Well, did human hands make heaven? Well, that's easy. No. Did human hands make the church? No, they didn't. Uh, instead, these things were made by God. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to delve deeply into this because we may get back to it in, uh, even as early as next week. But if you look at the great image uh, vision of D Daniel chapter 2, you'll remember he describes the stone that was cut out without human hands. And that's referring to the church. And the church is going to bust up all, it's going to be the kingdom that breaks up all the other kingdoms. And it's going to occupy the whole world. I'm going to leave it at that, because you may want to pick up on that again. But, but for the time being, just put that seed into your mind and, and contemplate it just a little bit. So the church and heaven are not made by man. They're, therefore, they're, they're the more perfect tabernacle. Uh, there, there are no flawed people serving in, uh, <clears throat> certainly not in heaven. Uh, and the one who offered the sacrifice for us, our high priest, uh, is, <clears throat> is perfect. And now notice, those offerings under the Old Testament, under particularly uh, or under uh, Moses' law, could not, did you notice this? Could not cleanse the conscience. Why? They couldn't get rid of sin. Didn't have any way to get rid of sin. Now, I find that very, very interesting because he's arguing here that Jesus can cleanse the conscience. And if you couple this in, look at 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 21, where he says, The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By the way, later translations, I think I mentioned that Sunday in one of the sermons, later translations don't use the word answer. They use the word appeal. The appeal for a good conscience. So in baptism, I appeal for a good conscience. On what basis? Well, it's not my good works. Instead, he says, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, that 
<clears throat> brethren, is a synecdoche. And uh, forgive me, my parents paid a lot of money for me to learn that word, so I'll use it every now and then. Uh, <clears throat> synecdoche, what's that? He said, we don't, we don't talk that way in South Mississippi. Synecdoche, oh, well, you may not use the word, but you use, you use it. Uh, you know, you ever go into an old person's house, an older person will say, hey, hey, you want anything to drink? Go in there and, and reach in the icebox and get some. Well, for, I hadn't seen an icebox in, you know, in years. Now, my great uncle did have one, uh, but I hadn't seen one in years. Uh, some of them, though, don't say it that way. They'll say, uh, just go in there and reach in the Frigidaire. Well, they don't even have a Frigidaire. They, 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 they may have a Samsung, or, or they may have an Amana or something, but they don't have a Frigidaire. What are they doing? A Synecdoche is a part that stands for the whole. Or it also can be, and it's interesting, a whole that stands for the part. Now, that's actually what happens in John chapter 3, verse 16. When Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, did Jesus die for the rivers and the trees? And that's easy. No, of course he didn't. Well, then there, the world stands for all mankind. See, that's the whole that stands for the part. But here, we're talking about part stands for whole. And think about it. Can you have a resurrection if you don't first have a death and a burial? Everybody nod your head this way. Can't do that. Not going to happen at all. So on what basis do I beg God for a clean conscience? Not on the basis of the offering of bulls and goats, but instead on the basis of the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because where did he shed his blood? In his death. Look at John 19, 31 to 35, and you're going to see that the soldier came to him, saw that he was dead already, pierced his side with a spear, and out came blood and water. So Jesus was offered so that I could have uh, freedom from my sins. So look at verse 15. We're, we're still in this uh, ninth chapter <clears throat> of Hebrews. And there he says, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the, look at that, first covenant, that those who are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So, Jesus died to redeem all those people under the law of Moses. Now, when I was growing up, it was pretty common to say that under the law of Moses, once every year on the Day of Atonement, that everybody's sins were rolled forward. I know why they use that image. Uh, it, it, it's better than nothing, you know, I guess. Uh, but, but it's not really what happened. On the Day of Atonement, God took the sins of the people under the law of Moses and he put them on account. Uh, if you... Uh, see, my children didn't understand this when they were, when they were uh, growing up. That we go in somewhere and they say, Oh, Daddy, Daddy, we, we'd love to have that. You know, whatever that was. And I said, Well, honey, we don't have the money. And they'd say, well, just put it on your credit card. Well, okay. But you do know that they're going to, at the end of the month, they're going to ask me to pay for whatever's on that credit card, right? Now, they put it on account, but I've got to pay for it, right? Isn't that correct? Yeah, of course it is. So what happened was those sins were not paid for by the blood of bulls and goats because we've already seen Hebrews 10 Blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. So instead, God put them on account. And when Jesus died on the cross and his blood was shed, all those accounts were marked paid. That's pretty good. Somebody want to do that with my credit card? See me after class. Okay, so, so see, that's, that's the idea that we're talking about here. Uh, Jesus died so that all could be set free. Uh, so let's, uh, let's continue 
uh, to look just a little bit. We want to pick up verse 16. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. Uh, your mom and dad, my mom and dad, whoever, may have a will. But you can't collect on a will till somebody dies. You know? Uh, that, uh, and some people you know, get really upset because they hear mom and dad changing the will. <laughs> and they might be being written out. You know, I mean, that's a possibility of the, of the will. Well, until they die, they can change that will all they want to. It's their will, right? Okay, so all he's setting us up for is that we've got, we've got a testament here, but we've got to have a death. And he goes on, For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated, watch this, without what? Without blood. See, they dedicated the law of Moses with blood, didn't they? He's going to talk about that. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. See, blood. Got to have blood for cleansing. That's, that's what he talks about, and for dedication in particular saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. All right, so watch him. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. So how was the tabernacle, how were the people, how, were, how was the book, how were all those things dedicated to God? The answer is with blood. And he used the word, look how many times he's used the word blood already. Verse 18, he used it once. 19, he used it once. 20, he used it once. 21, he used it once. Now watch 22. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. There it comes again. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Now, brethren, we're talking to our friends about salvation. The one thing that we need to always keep in our minds, we need to keep pushing it to the forefront. Nobody can be saved without blood. Nobody. Not me, not you, not your neighbor, not, not anybody you know you can't be saved without blood. Now watch this very carefully. You can't reach the blood of Christ by simply believing. Now, if you understand the word belief, then see, that's why I use the word simply. <laughs> you know, because they're, they're belief that is reinforced with works, well, that's a different story, you see. But uh, you, can't, you can't reach the blood through repentance. You can't reach the blood through confession, not alone. See, none of those things stand alone. But how do you reach it? Well, first of all, God know where it is. And some of you have heard me use this illustration before. Some illustrations just work for me. Uh, and it's because, you know, I'm old, and I'm, as the older you get, the more you remember things from years ago a lot better than you do what happened today. Uh, and see, that's what old people do. And I remember my mama. You know, one of, she had several things that were her favorite expressions and that she liked to do. Here's one of them. If I lost my belt, if I was trying to find my belt so I could go out uh, somewhere, and I go to my mom and say, Mom, where's my belt? She said, I don't know, Gary. Where'd you leave it? That was exasperating. You know, if I knew where I left it, I wouldn't be asking her. You know, but that was her question. So she made me learn to go back in my mind and find where'd I leave it. You know, and you know what? She, uh, she would say, you know, I think I, I took it off. When you made me, uh, well, you made me take off those muddy clothes from, from practicing baseball, uh, and, and then you told me to put on a bathrobe, go straight and get a shower. I believe I, I left it right there. She said, if that's where you left it, that's where you'll find it. She was not in the habit of picking up at her boy or her girls either. I'll be fair to her. You know, she just didn't do that. Okay, Where's the blood of Jesus? 
It's easy. We looked at it a minute ago. John 19, 31 to 35. It's in his death. They saw that he was dead and they pierced his side. So how do you get to the death? You know, there are only two passages in Scripture that, are, that tell you that. Colossians 2, 12 to 14, and Romans 6. You could go uh, 1 through 11. I like just 3 and 4. It's quicker uh, to do that. Both of those say you get to Jesus' death in baptism. You can't reach the blood without baptism. All your neighbors that say, I was saved when I accepted Jesus into my heart, they're wrong. And I'm not telling you they're, they're intentionally wrong. I'm not saying they're liars. That's not the point. But they're wrong. You know, and they're, they're, I've observed about myself, I can do something thinking it's right, and if it's wrong, it's still wrong. You know, I've, I've destroyed a few things by putting the wrong thing in the wrong place. And I, you know, especially if you're talking about electricity. It just kind of has a, a neat way of doing that, you know, <laughs> if you're not careful. You've got you to gotta do it right or you're in trouble. See, so blood is necessary to take away sins. The only way to get it to get rid of our sins. So 23 and 24, still in Hebrews 9. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. All right, so the earthly tabernacle had to be purified with the blood of bulls and goats. That's what he just said. He goes on. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. You see, if you've read earlier in the book of Hebrews, you're going to discover that Jesus is our high priest. Remember we talked about Melchizedek several weeks ago? We said Melchizedek was priest of the Most High God. And Jesus is a priest at the order of Melchizedek. Why? Well, he couldn't be a priest on earth. He wasn't from the right tribe. You had to be from the tribe of Levi in order to offer sacrifice on earth. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah, exactly. And if he's from Judah, he can't offer sacrifice on earth. Not without being in trouble. <laughs> He'd be violating the law if he did. So he's from the tribe of Judah. So where did he offer his sacrifice? He took his blood to heaven itself, to the very throne of God. And you know what? That blood is going to be the argument for your salvation and for mine. Look at the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation, the payment price, you would, you would say. Uh, so he gave his blood to pay the price for my sins. And when I stand in the day of judgment, when you stand in the day of judgment, if we're pronounced not guilty, it'll be because the blood of Jesus is in my life. It's the only way it's going to happen. That's what he's arguing here in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter, uh, chapter 9. So we're going to pick up again, a reading from there, uh, uh, beginning at verse 25. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with what? The blood of another. Here comes that word again. Just keeps popping up, doesn't it? Because he, he knows blood's vital to remission of sins. But, you know, the holy place entered on earth, they, they went in with the blood of another. Bulls, goats, that's the blood they took in there. Doesn't work. Jesus took his own blood, and that's what he's about to say. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he's appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I love that word, once. It's used several, it's going to be used again in this chapter. Uh, it's used several times in Scripture. It means once for all, what is perpetually valid, what needs no repetition. 
Derek, I don't remember what I was looking at the other day. And it's, it told me that the year that my uh, passport's going to expire. You know, they won't give you one of those things that lasts for the rest of your life. And in Mississippi, now in Mississippi, you can get a driver's license that's good for eight years. But at the end of the eight years, or before the end of the eight years, you've got to go get a new one, right? You've got to renew it. I, wouldn't you like to have a perpetually valid driver's license? Now, by the way, I don't want to be on the road with some people if they have a perpetually valid driver's license. They, they can't even drive now, you know, much less when they, they get old and can't see. But nonetheless, you know... Uh, Perpetual validity. I would love to pay my taxes. I would gladly pay double this year if I never had to pay again. Wouldn't you? <laughs> See, make it perpetually valid. I'll take it. That's a bargain. You know, I'll borrow money to do that because I'll never have to do it again. See, this idea here is that if Jesus had been offering the blood of bulls and goats, he'd have had to do it every year, every year. But he wasn't offering that. He was offering the perfect sacrifice himself. And so he only had to die one time. And the beauty of that is it goes all the way back to, to Adam and all the way forward to whatever the name of the last man on earth is, which I, I don't know what that'll be. But it, it'll cover all those sins if those people find his blood, which we've already talked about. We talked about how to get there. So then he goes on uh, in verse 27, and as is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ has offered, here it comes again, once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. What's he saying? The first time Jesus came to earth, he came to be a sacrifice. The next time he comes to earth, he will come to take us home. He's not going to deal with sin anymore. That's already been done. And we can either take advantage of his blood and therefore really look forward to his second coming. That's what he talks about here. And in so many other places, you see writers talk about that. Or... We can ignore what he did, and when he comes, we can live in fear because we're going to pay for it. So that's, that is a view of, of uh, Hebrews chapter 9, and, and it really lays out the tabernacle. Now, I wasn't sure how much time we'd have. I want to go into 10 just a little bit because that blood theme doesn't really stop in, in chapter 9. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sin. In other words, we'd say it this way, they'd be forgiven. But they're not forgiven. Those sins are brought up every year, every time they offer a sacrifice. Those sins are remembered over and over and over again. Until what? Until the death of Jesus. That's what he's talking about here. Uh, so he goes on. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the what? Oh, the blood. The blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I've come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Why did God give his son a body? Because a man who lived a sinless life had to die for all of those of us men and women who live sinful lives. That's why. He didn't hang on the cross for his own sin. Didn't have any. Didn't hang because he was guilty. He hung on the cross because I would be guilty. And you would be guilty. That's the argument, the point that the writer is making here. 
So Jesus came to earth, took that body. Why did he do that? To do the will of God. And doesn't really, the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, doesn't he get into that? When he talks about, uh, about his obedience, his going to the cross and dying for us, and God raised him up because he was obedient and he did what he was supposed to do. And when he raises him up, what does he say? He's giving him a name of every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And every tongue should confess that Jesus, uh, Jesus, for what reason? To the glory of the Father. To glorify God the Father. It's a beautiful, beautiful image. So he goes ahead in verse 8, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offering for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I've come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. Or wait a minute. First what? Testament. They may establish the second. How do you establish it? He died. How does any will come into force? You've got to die. And that's what he came to do. So, verse 10, by that will, we've been sanctified to the offering of the body of Jesus. Watch it. Here it comes again. Once for all. Now, when his body was offered, didn't he die? Mm-hmm. He died. So now his testament is in four. Now, as far as imagery goes, I can't show you scripturally that this is, is what happened. But it appears to me that in Acts chapter 2, that Peter took the will to probate. That he can't, he stepped forward and he said, look, here's the will of Christ. And when people stepped forward and they said, what must we do? He told them the terms of the will. You must repent and be baptized so that you, you can be saved or have the remission of sins. Now, wait a minute. What did the writer of Hebrews say had to happen to have remission of sins? Blood had to be offered. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. Was offered his blood. See, it all ties together, doesn't it? Just keep keep running out those running out those threads, and eventually you're going to see them all going together. And that's exactly what takes takes place uh, here. And now uh, I'm trying to watch my my time. I got I got enough time to do. Let's read further. I may not make a lot of comments till we get a little bit further down. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Remember, the blood bulls, the goats can't take away sins. They offered every day, didn't do any good, never took away sin. And so he goes on. But this man, talking about Jesus after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. And you want to tie that in? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because when all enemies are put at, down as Jesus' footstool, he's going to deliver the kingdom to God. Boy, the premillennialists have got it all messed up. He's not coming to earth to establish a kingdom He's coming to earth so he can deliver up his kingdom to the Father. That's what he says. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So keep going. For by one offering he's perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts and their minds and I'll write them. And then he said, he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds, I'll remember no more. That quote's coming from Jeremiah, where God anticipated a new covenant, a new testament, which is exactly what he's talking about here. Now, where there's remission of these, there's no longer an offering for sin. Now, wait a minute. What happened to the blood? All of a sudden, we're not, oh, next verse. Watch it. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. What's the holiest? Well, if you're talking about on earth, it's the holy, the holy of holies. 
But we're not talking about on earth, are we? We're talking about heaven. I'm going to be able to go to heaven, and you're going to be able to go to heaven with boldness. By the way, that, the idea there is with all speaking. I don't have to hold anything back. Why? Not because I'm perfect, but because his blood made me perfect. Took away my sins. Isn't that a beautiful thought? This, to me, this is one. I could teach on and preach on Hebrews from now until the day I die. Now, I guarantee you I could. I start with chapter 1, verse 1, go all the way through. It's beautiful. And right in here is, to me, some of the most beautiful of all things. Because he goes on to say, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. So see that tearing of the veil was symbolic of the opening of the flesh of Jesus, which opens up the way to heaven for me and for you. That is a wonderful, wonderful thought and a promise. Okay, I've gone fast. I've covered a lot of territory. So you, you have the opportunity to ask questions or make comments. Yes, ma'am. Well, okay, first of all, here's a real quick, rough summary. Uh, some people argue that, that since Jesus died once for all, that you can't fall away. I mean, that's, that's a really ab abbreviated statement of what you, what you, uh, you said in a little more detail. Uh, and my, res my response is, is to say, you know, why? Uh, first of all, the book, letter of Hebrews is written to Christians. It's not written to non-Christians. And it's very similar to some other letters like uh, Galatians that also talks about, it's written to the churches of Galatia, yet it talks about falling away. And I'm a kind of a simplistic-minded person at, at a lot of times, and I would say, how do you fall away from something you're never on, in or on? Say, I couldn't fall off a mountain I didn't ever climb. I, I couldn't fall off Denali because I would never climbed Denali. Now, uh, Mount Baldy in Arizona, I could have fallen off it. Thankfully, I didn't, but I mean, you know, but I could have. Uh, so that's a short answer. That's not really the thorough answer, but that'll give us. All right, next week, we'll, uh, we'll go forward with our searching for Jesus. Thank you.